Well, I'm Greg Sathoff, uh, Chair of the History and Intellectual Programming Committee for the Colonnade Club, and uh, would like to um, welcome you to this special presentation. <clears throat> this is the eve of the 75th anniversary of VE Day. Uh, what you'll hear today and see today is uh, an interview that I did very recently with uh, Jack Bertram, uh, uh, a highly awarded pilot uh, of a B-17 uh, during World War II. And uh, Jack will then be uh, able to answer questions directly from you who are watching this now. Uh, to answer the, to, to ask those questions, please uh, just submit uh, by way of the chat function. Uh, and uh, at the end of the interview, uh, those questions will be posed to Jack and, uh, and he will be uh, very pleased to answer them. So uh, look forward to uh, uh, hearing from you after, um, after we see the interview. Bertram, thank you for inviting us out to your beautiful home today, um, the day before the 75th anniversary of VE Day. Um, it's, uh, it's such a privilege to, to talk with you and to uh, get a chance to get to know you better. <clears throat> you know, after all, a few years ago, uh, you were introduced to many, many people in, in Charlottesville when the Jumbotron showed something of your life and, um, and then you walked out onto the field. Maybe, maybe we can just take a look at that right now to see what, uh, what so many thousands saw uh, prior to you walking out onto the field. It's an honor to be singled out uh, to represent uh, the 16 million World War II veterans. And uh, I'm honored to be here uh, in, in all due respect for them, in honor of them, and so many of them, some 400,000, who were the you know, true heroes World War II, we gave, you know, their last ounce of blood for our freedom. So uh, I'm fortunate and pleased and honored to be here. Thank you. You know, tomorrow uh, the Queen is going to address uh, her subjects <clears throat> on the 75th anniversary of, of VE Day. Uh, and uh, you were there. I mean, you were in England um, during, during that whole stay. And, and this is an opportunity to really learn more about, uh, about your experiences. Um, I know you because of the uh, uh, oral history that you provided for uh, Parade Rest uh, some years ago. And um, it was only later that um, I had an opportunity to see you on that football field. I do recall talking with uh, another B-17 crew member, and he spoke about the pilot in, a, in really reverential terms. He said, you know, we did not talk about the pilot. We didn't talk about our pilot. We would say, my pilot. And, uh, there's a poem by Sarah Churchill called The Bombers, and it also speaks about the pilot. And so this is an opportunity to, to really learn about your experience 
as a as as the pilot of uh, B-17 who flew 36 missions. Now, I wonder if you can just give us a little bit of background uh, about your family and uh, and your first ride in a plane. Yeah, my family uh, came from the countryside in uh, Pennsylvania and moved down to Altoona, which is the big, biggest city in that part of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's uh, about 125 mile east of Pittsburgh, and it's all mountains between the, the, there and Pittsburgh. But uh, it, it's uh, it's hard to conceive. Uh, I don't, you know, as a youngster uh, being drafted and so on. I don't think I ever uh, developed a feeling that I should have about leaving my parents by themselves. I have two brothers. Uh, both a year and a half and a year and a half older than I am. And uh, had I not been in school, we'd have been drafted all together. And uh, that might have been better because they were drafted directly into the Air Force <laughs> and went to Scottfield in, uh, in uh, St. Louis. But uh, it, it's, it's hard to imagine, I, uh, you know, we, oh, my wife and I bore five children, I can't imagine those or half of them going into the service just leaving you so uh, so all three of their family our family we left them and uh, it, it's hard to conceive how difficult that was for them so it was uh, over two years before I saw my mother and dad again and, uh, and that was that was true with most most of all of us in the service. So you were one of 16 million men who were drafted during um, or were commissioned during uh, World War II, and nine million of them uh, went overseas, in, including yourself. Absolutely. Uh, your decision or that opportunity to to go into um, uh, the Air Force at that time it was the Air Corps. Um, well, how, tell us about that, how that Well, I was very fortunate because I was, uh, one day we were there a couple of weeks at the classification center. Next thing you know, we were on a train with a group of uh, draftees. We had no idea where on earth where we were going. And I remember that train stopping and other trains going by. And it took us two days to get from eastern Pennsylvania down to uh, down to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, so. okay. and somewhere up in the mountain going down there, they they pulled out the orders to tell us where we were going. I don't think they could do that for 24 hours. So here I am, in the draftee in the field artillery at Fort Bragg, and uh, in the process of, of just finishing basic training down there in the heat and the sand. My brother uh, sent me a note uh, about taking an air cadet exam. He said, you might be able to take it if there's an air base there. So uh, I took the test and uh, lo and behold, I passed it. I mean, I could have jumped 10 feet in the air to say, here I am, an air cadet. That was the new title, air cadet. So you were taking those tests. Had you ever been in a plane before? Yeah, I was in a plane and I was 16 years old and we went down to, the name of the field was Stoltz Field. You know, they were all grass fields, just like we had in primary. And uh, they had barnstormers come in there and uh, 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 we, we, I, I have a friend of mine, his name was uh, Wirtz, Fran, Franny Wirtz. We went down there with my dad and mother, and you could get a ride for $5, which was even a lot of money then, I guess. But uh, So my mother said, and my dad's name was Chalmer, and, and, and she said, Chalmer, if you want to go up there 
and get yourself killed, you go ahead, but not my baby son is not going. <laughs> well, we did go, Randy Wurtz and I went for five dollars. And uh, that's the only time I'd ever been in an airplane. Uh, so you took the testing and, and you passed, these are pencil and paper tests, and then uh, you moved on to um, the beginnings of your training. Um, well, it really wasn't training at uh, Nashville, it was classification, and uh, they had all these cadets, they had, they had to classify them as either pilot, navigator, or bombardier. So, as I've said so many times, there were t tears of joy when the name, your name appeared for a pilot, and tears of regret and sorrow when they said you were assigned to a bombardier or a navigator. So then from there, if you were assigned as a pilot, you were eventually sent to Maxwell Field, which was pre-flight. Maxwell Field was was the headquarters of, uh, oh, I think, the whole Army Air Force at that time. So that was a disciplinary, disciplinary area, and the setup down there where it copied West Point, where you, you marched double time everywhere you went, and uh, you had uh, white glove inspections of, of your quarters where you lived, and uh, you were, for any infractions, you were disciplined and had to carry a rifle and walk so many, so many hours or whatever it might be. And, uh, and it was uh, strict physical training, too. They had, and, uh, and academic training. Uh, so in your training, um you you mentioned to me before that the training was extremely dangerous. I wonder if you can just tell us about the um, uh, the type of danger that you're speaking about. The flight training. Yes. Well, you know, w one of the dangers was air to air because there were so many planes in the air, and uh, my instructor was. Uh, he didn't bite your head off if you weren't real careful because any before you ever made a maneuver you had to clear yourself above, below, left and right uh, because there were a lot of accidents and uh, so that was you know that was critical all through the training because uh, the amount of airfields in the southeast and southwest were you know in hundreds and hundreds and uh, you know, indicative of the whole situation was that there were over 15,000 uh, flyers killed in training during 15, the war. 000. So it, it gives you some idea of uh, the, the activity. It was all these planes in the air and there was no traffic control. So, of course, in primary you didn't have any, you didn't have any communication with the ground at all. And that, that started in basic training. So. So when you were informed that you would be a pilot, did you know what what plane you would fly at that point? Oh uh, yeah, we knew we knew what model we were flying. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, they were all the same. Primary training we flew PT twenty three, which was a a Ryan manufactured by Ryan, who used to make streetcars. And uh, in basic training we flew a, a Volti Volti. Vibrator, we call it vibrator because it shook. When you, it, 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 that was that introduced us to a two-pitch prop. The primary is a fixed prop, and uh, so you would use that two-pitch for power and so on. And it would shake the windows and the <laughs> and uh, on the houses down below. In advanced training, we went to two engine. Uh, I, if I, uh, you know, I'd ask for multi engine, so you flew two engine and had retractable landing gear. So you advanced through this thing. In basic training, you went to, f to instruments for the first time, flying instruments. So it was, 
a, a challenge all the way through. And, uh, so ultimately, you were you were informed that you would um, you would be the pilot of the largest type aircraft that uh, that the U.S. had at the time, the B-17. Yeah, to take a deep breath, that was that was unbelievable because you. Uh, you know, one was at the mercy of what they needed. You know, some some of them were assigned uh, to fly P-47s. You know, and pull gliders and things like that. So, uh, uh, I, I was fortunate. To, uh, I felt to, to be selected for that. Uh, that was a big airplane, and uh, the first first thing we ever did, that plane instructor took me up and we stalled it. <laughs> stalled that big plane and it, it was for pretty stable really but uh, that puts a lot of pressure on the plane when you stall it tremendous pressure on the tail and the wings and so on but uh, it it, uh, it was a good thing to start with to set us straight on what the thing how stable it was so you took the ship uh, to uh, to England with uh, thousands of other troops? Uh, Purported to be 20,000. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it was every, everywhere you went, uh, you know, somebody slept and uh, uh, and it was like a floating crap game. <laughs> they had games, people uh, on the floor all over playing money games. So. So we and we ate at uh, uh, we ate at ten in the morning and eight in the afternoon, two two meals. Uh, I don't remember much about those meals. I don't think they amounted to much. But uh, we ate a lot of Hershey candy. Mm -hmm. You can you can go to their PX, so to speak, and buy Hershey bars. So, and uh, the only other thing I remember about that is Joe Lewis was on board. So the boxer, right? <laughs> and uh, I think he was, you know, assigned to uh, uh, you know put on shows, make mm -hmm. distract people, make them well, and so on. I didn't see him, but I, I heard he was on there. So this is a model of the plane that you flew. That's as exact as you can get. Uh, this was named Knockout Baby. Let me just uh, see if you can describe this to us and, and explain to us where the, your crew members sat and their significance. Well, to get, to get in this thing, uh, the crew members in the center, the, the Bombardier, not the bombardier, but the two waste gunners, the ball turret gunner and the radio gunner would go in this door right here and, and enter into that part of the plane. The tail gunner had his own door, little door back here that he would get in. And uh, the tail gunner was unique and I, I, I can't imagine anybody ever volunteering for that job because you face the opposite way. You face back this way. And uh, there was no way out of that thing. Uh, as I said, the only advantage that he had was, number one, he had a comfortable seat the way he was in there. And number two, he had a door that he could bail out. <laughs> he didn't have to wait for anybody. So, and then, in, uh, I think I did repeat it. They said, this door here, we've got four crew members there. And then right here, there was a door uh, where we would chin ourselves to, to get up in. So the, to the, uh, all the officers, the four officers, and the engineer gunner would go in, in here. And uh, the engineer gunner stood, this is his turret, and he stood up to that. Uh, I, think there, I think there was a little little seat he could rest like. And then behind here then is a bomb bay right through here. So, the, and there's a narrow catwalk that you can walk from here across 
uh, through the bomb they uh, to the radio gunner as a, uh, a closed operation there where his inside is to you know a door that he, to get into so he's in there all by himself and then uh, down in the nose of course he had no he, uh, they put a, a turret on it when I first went over there they didn't have these turrets this is a a sign, uh, signified by being a B-17G with a chin turret. And they started to get those after I flew a few missions over there. And uh, so the bombardier or navigator sat in, sat in there. They had these two guns here and then the two on a turret. And, uh, and the ball turret gunner, of course, was down here. And he had twin twin uh, 20 millimeters and, and the uh, top gunner had a uh, twin and the tail gunner had twin so they were like 13 uh, 20 caliber machine guns <laughs> the most uncomfortable place in the plane were the two waist gunners uh, they didn't have any any place to sit in particular and and uh, it was probably the coldest place in the plane. And of course, you know, the pilot and the co-pilot sat right in here, side by side. And uh, so we had, uh, we had parachutes that clipped to our harness right here. And uh, the pilot and co-pilot could not use those, so we, stashed ours behind a seat. So there weren't too many pilots and co-pilots that were able to access those chutes and get them on and and to be able to bail out. They were they were last. So So the pilot would be the last one to bail out if that was necessary. That's right. Okay. And uh, you know the they they would go out this door down here to, if uh, if they got to that point. And did you mention the radio operator? Yeah, the radio operator was uh, right right on the back side of the bomb bay. Uh, it had the ball turret gunner and the radio radio room and. Uh, so he was pretty well secluded in there. And we had we had one mission where uh, the shrapnel came up through the bottom of the plane and tore a hole in his in a seat. It was a swivel seat by the radios and so on. He was he was not in the seat at the time. He was throwing chaff out. We had a, a small, uh, a little small hole where you could throw metallic chaff out, supposedly to to uh, throw off the the uh, 88 millimeter guns. And I think it really attracted him rather than throwing them off. So he was up doing that, and uh, and. Uh, we got hit with shrapnel came up through there and you know by some miracle he did not get hit and uh, so he when when we got back a number of hours later he was still in a state of shock we had to help him off the plane so so to look at that plane you know it's easy to think about the uh, you know the monumental size uh, but what's really significant about the B-17s were that they flew in formation. I wonder if you can talk about the challenge of formation and, and why was it that uh, that the bombers flew in formation? Well, of course, formation was the name of the game. And uh, we did a little formation flying and advanced training and a little uh, and transition training on a B-17. And then we did a lot down in Florida where we were 
taking training for combat. And there is no such thing as training for combat. And you forget that. You, you get trained on combat the first time you get in it. Uh, so uh, when we got to England and uh, we went, uh, my records show that we went three times in, in, in formation practice. You know, they wanted to find out uh, if you could really fly formation. So, of course, the, the true purpose of it was to get a concentration of, of bombs, you know, in the, in the same area. Uh, it, the, the English flew at night, and uh, they sort of bombed at random, and we we probably didn't uh, bomb as accurately as we'd like to think we did, but we uh, we always had an alternative target also if the weather was bad. And there was a lot of weather over there. Sometimes you didn't get it till you got to the target. So, and, and also, uh, secondly, and probably equally as important, it gave you a little protection. I mean, if you were flying by yourself in the daylight, uh, you wouldn't have much chance against fighter planes, but uh, in a tight formation, then it gave you uh, added, added protection, pretty good protection. There were lots of memorable missions that you took, uh, four to, to Berlin, uh, and, and in the early days of, of, of bombing Berlin in 1944. Can you tell us, what, what is it like to, um, to learn that, uh, that you're going to be bombing Berlin? Well, Berlin was a nasty word, and uh, they, they had only, uh, they had just bombed it for the first time. Of course, they had uh, a slew of fighters around there, and and uh, it was brief for like 688 millimeter guns, and uh, they they can shoot like 15 shells a minute, so that's a lot of artil artillery coming out. So you know, when we learned uh, when they pulled the game, pulled the cord, and uh, opened up. The map we learned we were going to Berlin, and uh, so you know you have mixed emotions. You know, not not something that uh, you would choose, but so you know now I'm going to be a part of it. You know, and we accept that. So so we did, and uh, the the identity of uh, a place like Berlin is that uh, if, if you're not first in and then you're, you've got all these groups going in and you finally get in, the sky is literally black. You can see it, it you're right ahead of you. And uh, so that's, that's the identity of a big city being bombed. So you, uh, so you just uh, grit, your, grit your teeth and sail into it because there's no variation in speed, there's no variation in altitude, it's fixed, absolutely fixed. After they drop the bombs, they do <laughs> evasive action. They, they make a turn and drop down to 500 feet. And we always said well, we're, we're just dropping down to where they can aim a little closer to us. <laughs> yeah. There was a flight that you took or a mission to Munich that was um, uh, particularly uh, treacherous. Yeah, Munich's a long story. And, uh, you know, uh, somebody really took care of us in that mission because we got, we had just dropped the bombs and uh, uh, I think we were flying at 27,000 feet and we, we just got the bomb day doors closed and we, we took uh, like a direct hit right around the Bombay doors and uh, it knocked out the left inboard engine and it knocked out uh, the, the turbo controls for the other en engine because those, those engines will not fly without, without turbos. They don't, they'll fly but they don't have the power. And uh, 
then we were alerted to, to waste gunner was badly hit in the shoulder and a cable cut and uh, and we immediately were knocked out of formation uh, and and started down so uh, I, you know I had, I had to collect uh, what happened and see where we were and uh, the other thing we lost was oxygen, so it was, we we definitely had to to uh, keep going down, and uh, we went down to like 5,000 feet, and uh, I collected all the information, trying to decide whether to go back alone all the way from Munich, or to go to Switzerland and be interned, which was which was. Uh, Right, right off our wingtip, almost. We were pretty close to Switzerland, and uh, but anyway, we made this decision to come back, and uh, the navigator took control of of uh, where we we're going on the way back to keep us away from cities, and and uh, I identified uh, fighter fields and so on, and. Uh, Somehow we got back. Uh, you know, they they spliced the cable for for the uh, vertical elevator, and uh, uh, and uh, the the waste gunner was, you know, was doctored up to where he was, you know, not losing blood and so on. So we went we went back and. Made it back, and it, it tore up the Bombay big main structures, just ripped them in half. So, had we been hit anywhere else on a wing tail, uh, that'd have been the end of it. And uh, so, having to fly back at low altitude, you were for uh, for hours. You were extremely vulnerable. We were, yeah. It was a long trip back. And I, a, a fellow out in California who was a waste gunner, another plane, wrote in his book, uh, and, and he he knew our crew that he saw us go down, and he said they're not they're not coming back. So he wrote that in his book. And I talked to him later. So there was another flight that, uh, and this is the flight that uh, prompted the French government to give you the Legion of Honor. Uh, metal. Can you tell us about uh, about that flight? How did that come about? Well, that was a that was a secret flight. There, there was another flight scheduled that day, but uh, there were 13 crews of us, and we had been briefed separately, and it was totally secret. You weren't allowed to to talk about it. Uh, but we went into the briefing room with the rest of them, and we took off with them. And then somewhere, probably around 15, 18,000 feet or somewhere, we deployed from that group, and we headed. To, it, we were we were loaded with uh, two 12-foot cylinders uh, with a parachute packed on one end, and they were they were filled with small arms for the French Marquis, and the French Marquis were were uh, an extremely active group down in, uh, uh, in, in the foothills of the Alps, uh, in, in the French right near, the, right near the Italian Alps, so not, not too far from Italy. And uh, so we were go down and drop those things, and uh, it was set up that uh, that we would go all the way down, you know, to like 500 feet in the foothills down there, and uh, at a signal from the British Broadcasting Corporation, they would light, the marquee would light fires, bonfires, and uh, so we had, we had to get these things as close to them as they, as they, as we could, and uh, so we went down there, and sure enough. Uh, when we got near there, we started to see these fires and men jumping around. It was thrill of a lifetime, and uh, so we made a pass and dropped these one by one. 
And uh, so to add a little excitement, when we dropped ours, one of them hung up, parachute hung up on the Bombay door. So we, we've got this pendulum swinging, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how many thousand pounds or more, who knows how many, what the weight of it was. And uh, so we were down, we were down, we had our wheels down and our airlines out, you know, that's the only way we could keep us proper speed and fly that low. So I made one circle, did a lot of wing waving, and it didn't cut loose. And Tried to shake it off. Right. Second time around, uh, it, it shook off. So now we're going to head back, and uh, the other 12 planes are long gone. They didn't wait for us. So we, we went to close the Bombay doors, hit the switch, nothing happened. Sent the, sent the, uh, the uh, engineer gunner down there and he wasn't having any luck, sent the co-pilot down. And we find out that the, the main drive shaft is bent from uh, all this weight swinging back and forth. So there's no way we're gonna close the door, so we we flew back home, which was, this was a 10 hour mission, so it was a long way back with uh, the Bombay doors open. First, the first time I ever landed a plane with the Bombay doors open. <laughs> so, we, you know, we, we flew back through all this occupied territory uh, and, you know, never ran into any opposition. So we did that twice. You know, the one back from Munich was all over occupied territory. So, so it was a, a thrilling day, a different, different day. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, when when people think about B-17 and and popular culture, they might think of the film uh, Twelve O'Clock High. Uh, but there was another film. A famous war film called *The Longest Day*, <clears throat> which was about the invasion of of Normandy. Uh, but you figured into that as well, didn't you? And it was perhaps the longest day for you as well. Can you tell us about that? Well, it was the most exciting day because we, uh, I mean, we it, it, flying in and out. We had vision to some of the things that were going on on the island. Uh, we could see. C-47s practicing pulling gliders and and all our, our artillery. I mean, there were just, you know, there were several million uh, troops and all types of military gear that they could not hide. So there was no question, uh, you know, that we were getting close to uh, having the invasion. And uh, so, when it was, so when it did happen, I mean, we, we couldn't have been happier. And uh, we, we flew, I think most bomb groups flew three missions that day. And uh, so, I mean, I was, we were pleased to fly the first and the third and, you know, to be a part of that significant day, you know, that the world been waiting for was, was really uh, invigorating for us. And, uh, and we did not have the danger in any shape or form that they had on the ground. But uh, so we, we bombed inland uh, in great numbers to try to weaken the, the German structure that, uh, that were uh, camped in there. So, so, so we, we, we bombed we, we took off at night and uh, formed early and got over there early on the first mission. Then we came back and reloaded and came back again. Yeah. So 35 missions was the maximum. You, you flew 36. Uh, well, their accounting, uh, they, their accounting wasn't accurate. I didn't, I didn't get credit for two missions on D-Day. Mm -hmm. so, so I got to fly another one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so at 35 missions, uh, your tour is over. 
tour is over. When I went over there, uh, the missions, uh, I don't think not too far before I got over there, went from 25 to 30. While I was there, they went from 30 to 35. And uh, they, they never went any higher than that. <laughs> so you've talked to me before about the, the ground crew and the support system required in order to keep uh, uh, keep you in the air. Can you just mention uh, the Well, the, you, know, the you know, the planes we were flying were theirs. They belonged to the ground crew, and uh, they uh, cherished those planes and were determined, you know, to, to make them the best plane that was on the field. And, uh, you know, they, they were available and worked 24 hours a day, so there was never uh, never any delay on the availability of planes uh, because they didn't have enough personnel, because they did. And uh, those, the, that, the personnel was permanent. You know, they were there from early in the beginning. And uh, so you, we were flying their plane. And, uh, Oh, we got to know some of those people, and uh, that's the way they felt, and that's the job that they did. So we we went out. We had a, I had a lot of confidence in the plane. We, we, we I, went, I flew a lot of different planes, and I was never. Uh, I, I never believed that it was bad if you had to fly a number of planes as opposed to flying them one the first time. Superstitious. Mm -hmm. I was not superstitious, so. We got we got to quite fly quite a few planes. And, uh, so you in the, in your thirty six missions, as I understand, there were thirteen different planes that you flew. Um, but in every single one of your thirty six missions, you had the same exact crew. That's exactly right. We did. And uh, how unusual is that? Well, I think it's very, very unusual, and uh, you know the, the the personnel was set up so that they had they always had available somebody on a crew, co-pilot, navigator, tail gunner, whatever, to fill in uh, in the possible that particular day. They may not know everybody's going to be there until everybody gets out of bed and so on. So. We didn't. I was really proud of my crew because they. Uh, I'm sure they had the fears and concerns for their lives that everybody else had. Uh, but uh, you know, we we spoke well with each other. Uh, we had confidence in everybody in every in every position. Uh, you know, they loved they loved the bombardier and. The navigator, I think, was 19 years old, and uh, always had a smile. You know, never, never panicked. So, uh, so it was that way through. The uh, ball turret gunner was the old man. He was 27 years old, and we thought he acted like he was 40. <laughs> but uh, he, he was a great addition to the crew. So. You mentioned to me the importance of faith. Well, we you know we did have faith. We always had a short short prayer before we started, and uh, we didn't uh, we didn't we didn't dwell on faith. I mean, we just uh, I think everybody had it. I I, I honestly never went out. To a mission and and felt like I wasn't going to get back. Never ever did that. I don't know why. I mean, I'm sure there were a lot of pilots that way, but I, I was never concerned about. You know, I, I was concerned about what we were going to go through, all the difficulties and so on, and the risk. But uh, I, I never. It never revealed any fear of uh, getting back. And I think I was critical, you know, you have to, people have to have the confidence. And, uh, 
Yeah. Did you uh, did you get into uh, England much or into London? Yeah, we did. We got uh, you know we get two day passes to get down there, and uh, one of those two day passes took took me off the shuttle mission to Russia. I had been briefed on a shuttle mission to Russia. You know, if one of the crews were supposed to go. Of course, they never knew when they were going to go. And whenever they went, I was down in London on a two-day pass. So I missed, I missed that mission, which which would have been exciting too. Uh, no, London was uh, the first time we went to London. Oh, there were four of us. I don't really even know whether they were just all my crew or but four officers, and we we rented this uh, cab for all day and uh, used his, his gas rationing for, who knows, a couple of weeks, I don't know. But anyway, we paid him well. We made an arrangement with him. So we were with him all day long, and he took us all through the Blitz area, everything that was destroyed. And uh, that, was, that was the first time that we went to London. That was fascinating. I have a soft spot in my heart, in my heart for the English people. They are so delightful, and and uh, we don't we don't live this World War II here. You know, it's a long time ago, and we've had a lot of other wars uh, that have, that have cl clouded our mind and so on. But over there. Uh, World War Two is as f almost as fresh as when fresh it happened. The, the the little the children everybody are uh, so knowledgeable and and so sensitive, you know, about what what goes on. It's pretty remarkable. So when your tour was over, you left England and flew and um, and took a ship back. Uh, tell I us got, about that. Yeah, I, got, I said I got my reward for flying missions because they came back with Churchill. And uh, Churchill's whole contingency was on that thing. When, who, I don't know who was fighting the war, but all, all his, uh, you know, his military people, his Air Force people were on that plane, including Clementine, his wife. So, uh, and we dropped them off at Halifax Nova Scotia, and, and they were going to the, the the second Quebec conference, which was quite significant back in those days. So, yeah, we got uh, we had uh, menus, and which I, I had one, and it's long gone, unfortunately. And we had a choice of uh, of uh, venue and. Uh, <laughs> that we never thought we'd ever see again. So they treated us pretty well. When any officers, officers uh, had them, they had a movie, an officers movie as well as an enlisted man. And so we go in there and see all these English with stripes all the way up and down their arms, which were all all his staff. But uh, and there weren't too many on board. You know there were. Quite a few uh, D-Day casualties mm -hmm. on board. And, uh, so you came back in uh, was it what September of uh, 1944? Yes, yeah, September or maybe October. I'm mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. You remember coming into the United States then, sailing in? Oh, uh, that I do. Uh, do you find out how significant the Statue of Liberty is? Well, sure. When, you know, whenever you come back from combat, so. So since that time, um, you kept in touch with your crew over the years? I did. I sent Christmas cards religiously to all the crew for years and uh, then, you know, over the decades and decades. And, one drops out here and one there where you don't hear from it anymore. And uh, then when I, when I retired, uh, we went to Florida and, uh, and the ball turret gunner was down there. And uh, 
also the uh, engineer gunner. So we, we got together and down there quite a bit. And it was like, like old times. So, and I got to see my, I got to see the navigator. June and I were going out to her, her daughter's place in Indiana. And he lived around Louisville or Indianapolis, I think it was Louisville. When he called to see if we could stop there, and he said his wife wasn't well. And I said, well, we're not, we're not going to stay. I just want to stay alone and uh, hug each other. So anyway, we went, and when we knocked on the door, she came to the door and said he was in a hospital, and they had discovered cancer. So we talked her into taking us down. And so we got to see him in there. He was uh, same youthful, friendly, you know, guy, even though he was, he was uh, diagnosed with terminal cancer. So we got to see him and he didn't, I think he was gone, unfortunately, you know, in a, in a month or so. So what do you think about this term, uh, the greatest generation, which is used to describe you and uh, other service members from World War II? Well, I don't know. It's uh, I think it's easier described by somebody that wasn't in an, in the greatest generation. Uh, you know, we we did what everybody uh, you know. I did what everybody else did. You know, you you were going to sign up and try to do your little part, whatever it was. You know, to protect the country because uh, Hitler was a madman and. Uh, you know, we were we were deep into it, so we didn't. Uh, I didn't do anything, or nobody else did anything more than 16 million did. You know, they signed up, and it was uh, something you wanted to do. And uh, the great, you know, being a part of the greatest generation never entered into it. Uh, mm. Still doesn't, in some respect. I mean, I'm. I'm getting up in there, and there's not too many left, so um, you're giving me all this attention, you know, that I normally wouldn't get. But uh, so, do you remember where you were 75 years ago, uh, tomorrow VE Day, 1945? I was in the Lockburn Army Air Base in Columbus. Yeah, and uh, I checked my records, and I and I was I didn't fly that day. I was on the ground. So uh, I think I was married at that time. We got married in the summer, so I'm sure my wife and I heard it via radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was there for VJ Day, but in VJ Day I was in the air, and I was I was still at Lockburn. And uh, on on VJ Day we found out that. Uh, the uh, Niagara Falls was going to turn the lights on, so I got uh, I got another fellow. We took two B-17s over there and saw the saw the lights on Niagara Falls. <laughs> that was that was our way of celebrating the end of the war. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Some people have compared the current time with this. Uh, pandemic uh, to World War II, just in terms of how it's affected so many people. Um, any any thoughts or reflections about that? Since we're we're in the pan pandemic now, which is why we're we're outside and we're uh, seated far apart. Well, I, I, I would comment on it. You might not want it on the record, but uh, this so happened. I listened to uh, the sixth episode of. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's life, and it and it it is at the time when then when we declared war, and the leadership that he had is what we need now, with what we lack now. And that that would be my my only comment on him. And everybody uh, everybody else is helping each other. It's remarkable 
uh, people were stepping out, the youth are stepping out and and doing creative things, you know, to help other people in different neighborhoods. So there's no lack of that. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I, I see a lack of leadership at the top. And So Jack, you were born um, on uh, Armistice Day, 1920, 100 years ago. <laughs> that I was. <laughs> Armistice Day, that was two years after the armistice the World War One, and uh, at 11 o'clock all the church bells rang all over all over the country and uh, that was that was their way of identifying you know the the end of World War one so well I uh, we had, <clears throat> we, I appreciate that um, you took the opportunity and agreed to sit down with us. Uh, everyone who knows you knows that you're a, a man of great humility and not one to put yourself forward. Um, we, uh, we appreciate it greatly and uh, we're going to be opening this up for some uh, questions uh, from the audience and um, Look forward to uh, have you answer those uh, live. So, thank you very much. Well, I'd be pleased to do that. And uh, again, I'm I'm just uh, deeply appreciated the fact that uh, that you have me here and and uh, per permit me to uh, you know express a few memories and so on. And certainly uh, not in my name, but in the name of of all the veterans, uh, so many of which are, uh, lost their life at that time, and now uh, they're dwindling away, is uh, my dear friend Harry Hall, the bombardier, who I've been very close to for 75 years. We visited each other. He lives in the West Coast, and uh, he passed away in January, so uh, uh, I was first in the crew and now I'm last. I guess that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> well, on behalf of the Colonnade Club, I, I want to thank you again. Uh, it's really been a great privilege. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, Greg, we have a few questions um, for Jack. So Jack, are you ready for your questions? I am here, yes, thank you. All right, so the first question is, um, what did 12 o'clock high get right or wrong when they did that movie? Did What did they do right and what did they do wrong? Uh, I thought it was uh, very well done. Uh, it, it showed uh, the intensity, uh, not only of the men flying, but also of the leadership. Uh, the responsibilities that they had were, uh, were awesome. Uh, I, I really could not be critical of that movie. Okay. All right, so that's great, thank you. Um, the next question is, what percentage of the planes made it to 30, 32 missions? Do you know of your bombardier, your B-17s, did a lot of them make it to 32 or not very many? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. So did, did very many of the B-17 planes make it to, were they able to complete 32 missions or did they, did they not survive? Talk, speaking of the planes themselves? Yeah, the planes and the crews, how did they do? Did the B-17s hold up well? The B-17s were a highly quality airplane. Uh, no plane will stand up to the heavy artillery and fighters that we uh, 
experience, uh, we lost a lot of planes, um, not because they were faulty. And we lost a lot of crews, not because they didn't do their job. Okay, thank you. So it was a high risk job. It was. I, I just found out uh, I had uh, lost a, a close friend, just found out from a book uh, that I received absolutely this day. And uh, it was on a long mission to Czechoslovakia and he got, didn't get back. And we lost in the 8th Air Force 39 planes on that, 39 planes in crews on that mission. And I was on that wow. mission. Wow. So, Jack, um, another question. You're, you're doing terrific. So I have another question, and that is, if you could go back when you look at all of your missions, is there any one thing that you would change? <laughs> I, I would not change because we got back on all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really can't address that, that question beyond that. It's a good question. All right. No, that's great. That's great. Um, two more questions and then I'll, um, we'll see if there's any other ones on the, um, on the chat box. Um, one is, did they let you practice bailing out before you actually went to combat? Did, in the, did we get to practice in England? Yeah, or yeah, in we, Florida we, or wherever you were? Well, we practiced formations and practiced uh, the crew, you know, performing uh, what his responsibilities were going to be. But uh, there was no... Uh, when we got to England, we flew formation three times. To, they wanted to see how good we were, and that was it. And uh, the normally over there, the first mission, the pilot flew as a co-pilot. So, so when he came back, he flew his first mission. He already had the experience of being in combat one time. Uh, for some reason, uh, I flew my first mission and every other mission with my crew. So we were awful fortunate to get through with it. It's so very nice that you have the same crew. Well, it was, you know, it's, uh, you, you keep that rapport, rapport and uh, you, you know, you really know, you get to love each other. You know, you're, you're living together. Pretty tight quarters up there. Well, it certainly so sounds had, uh, like the, the, the NAV, uh, we gave the responsibility to the bombardier to communicate with all the crew in the back of the ship, because they're, you know, it's, 10 hour missions many times and they don't know what's going on unless somebody tells them. And the worst spot that I know I was to be in the back of the plane for all those hours with all the tension and fears and so on and not be know what's going on. So the bombardier performed that, uh, that uh, responsibility and the uh, gave some uh, experience and communication to each of the crew, which was really vital. Wow, that's really impressive. That's very impressive. Do you have anything else that you would like to make sure we know while we're talking with you? No, I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for this experience and uh, I send my thanks to every individual that's uh, watching this. Uh, I'd like to meet each one of you. Uh, so um, I'm grateful for for this and uh, my family's uh, in a position to watch this also. So I'm gonna have to put up with them until when it's all over, they'll tell me what I did wrong. 
they would, uh, anyway, Jack, thank you so much. Uh, Jack, after our interview, you mentioned to me that you had wished you had said something about the village that you flew out of, <clears throat> Horror. I'm um, sorry, Greg. You, uh, you mentioned that one thing you'd like to do this evening was just to tell the audience about the village that you flew out of, <clears throat> Horham, in England. Yeah, it's, it's somehow I'm not understanding Horham. a lot of part of it. Tell them about Horham. Oh, wait, 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 wait talk about the, the field that we flew out of, absolutely. Uh, it was in Horham, H-O-R-H-A-M, in East Anglia, uh, in, that, in that map. Uh, we were 15 miles from the North Sea in, in, that, in that area, which is the, about the equivalent of five counties right here where we are, Albemarle and four more. There were 46 bomb groups. Uh, and uh, the 13th Air Wing, which we were in, was, was three of those bomb groups were closer than one of them. One field would be our airport today in Charlottesville, and two more of five and seven mile apart, closer than downtown. So they were packed in there, and there was no, no traffic control in those days. The only communication you had with the field was a homing beacon, which you could find your field on the way home. But there was no communication from one group to another. Tell them about Forum today. Forum today is the same as it was 77 years ago. Hedgerows, uh, just beautiful little narrow roads, uh, no stores. There's, there's one store in Horum, uh, and it, it was there uh, when we were there, and it's still there today. Uh, and that's the only store in there. Um, it's an it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. With Quonset huts. There, the, the, they restored the one Quonset hut that was left uh, over there, and uh, now they've added some additional ones. And they they are the most active uh, organization in East Anglia, uh, they have a beautiful museum. Uh, museum? So it's a great place to go and I would recommend, uh, it's, it's heartwarming to go over there and see it. The people are, are just uh, incredible. They're, they're so grateful and uh, treat you uh, um, ways that you would search for. Yeah. Well, Jack, we are very grateful that you took the time to share your memories and recollections and insights uh, with us. And uh, I have here uh, a, a book that you had put together. It's called uh, A Time Remembered uh, by Jack Bertram, a 60 page book where you detail. Uh, your own experience as a as a B-17 pilot and those 36 missions. And you were kind enough to, uh, to say that if, uh, if there are those in the audience who would like to make a donation uh, to uh, the human rights book and the proceeds then would go to a uh, coronavirus uh, charity uh, locally. And uh, so anyone who is in the audience who uh, is interested, uh, please email us uh, at the Colonnade Club and we can tell you how uh, Jack will inscribe one of these books for you uh, uh, in exchange for a donation for those who are suffering today. And uh, let me thank you again and let me thank Jack, uh, Jan Balmer uh, our president of the Colonnade Club uh, for all the work you've done on this, uh, Jan, and for fielding and vetting these questions.
It's special to be a part of this. So very special. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. Have a All right, thank you to everyone and have a good evening. <laughs>